Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and in today's video, we're gonna be going over and scoring our Unit 8 practice of our queue. Now, just a quick note before we get into the video, my neighbors are having their roof redone about 15 feet that way. So if you hear some strange noises partway through the video, great example of noise pollution from Unit 7 is happening right out there. With the exam just a few weeks away, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my upcoming exam prep videos and live stream review sessions. And also make sure to check out this study plan that I put together linked in the video description below. It breaks down the most important vocabulary terms that you need to know for each topic on the exam. And trust me, not using precise enough vocabulary is one of the number one reasons that APE students struggle on the FRQ section of the exam every year. So make sure to check out the study guide and review these important vocabulary terms so that you are ready to write like a scholar. Speaking of writing, like a scholar, this week's FRQ submission comes to us from an ape scholar named Wilson. Wilson, where are you? <laughs> Wilson! Thanks for sending in your FRQ from, well, wherever it is you're floating in the thermal haline circuit these days. As always, the scoring guide for this FRQ is down in the video description below. In part A, Wilson gets off to a great start, picking up both possible points. First, he describes that microbes can cause the digestive tract to become blocked, which can slow down metabolism. And second, he describes how these pollutants can bioaccumulate in organisms such as keystone species. Now in part B, we have an outdated scoring style where the college board is actually hiding two possible points within one single task verb. Luckily, you won't have to worry about that this year because other than the calculate task verbs, you can expect that each bold task verb will be worth one point. Now Wilson was able to pick up one of the two points by describing how nitrates added to the water can cause algal blooms. Unfortunately, he just narrowly misses the second point by by stating that algal blooms, quote, require a lot of oxygen when they decompose. Now, what he left out here is that this decomposition is carried out by microbes, which consume the oxygen. And the way that it's worded here, it almost sounds like the algae are consuming the oxygen rather than the microbes that are breaking them down. In part C, Wilson unfortunately misses the identified points in parts one and two. In part one, describing a quote, drain-like system, instead of a filter or a screen, is just a little bit too far off the mark. And in part two, he mixes up secondary treatment and disinfectant. Remember that the microbes are added for the aerobic decomposition that occurs in secondary treatment, but then those microbes and any remaining pathogens are killed with disinfectant, such as chlorine or UV light, before the release of the treated wastewater. In part three of letter C, Wilson misunderstood the prompt a bit and described an advantage of biosolids over synthetic nitrate-based fertilizers. And the disadvantage he provided is just not really a major concern with using biosolids as fertilizer, since they're not generally decomposing under anaerobic conditions when they're spread over fields. But luckily, Wilson finishes strong by picking up both points in part D. First, by identifying that humans are clearing mangroves to make space for farming, and second, for identifying visitors looking for recreation as a cultural service provided by mangroves. So while he was lost at sea for a little bit in this FRQ, Wilson drifted back towards scholarly writing and ended up with a five out of 10 on this FRQ. So with the exam just around the corner, let's plug this practice FRQ score Wilson got into our APES exam score calculator and see what kind of overall score that might lead to. Now remember this APES exam score calculator is linked down in the video description below, so you can do this too with your practice FRQs. So we're gonna start out here by plugging in Wilson's score of a five into the FRQ average box and then we're gonna see what kind of multiple choice scores he would need to earn different overall exam scores. Now, in my experience, students who average a five out of 10 on their FRQs are typically not scoring any worse than the 60% on the multiple choice portion of the exam. And so we can see that if Wilson scores even as low as a 60% on his multiple choice portion, he would be in great shape to earn at least a three on this exam. However, if Wilson can get his multiple choice scores into the upper 60s, or even 70%, he should be able to sneak into the four range on this exam. And this is probably the score I'd expect Wilson to get if he can average five out of 10 on his three FRQs on this year's exam. All right, moving on from APES exam score projections, let's take a look at our final FRQ Friday prompt, which covers ocean acidification and comes to us from the 2019 exam. So in the background for this FRQ, we have this graph showing the measurements of atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, as well as the measurements of the pH levels at the ocean nearby at station Aloha. Now the first thing you need to do when you see a graph that has two different y-axis labels or y-axis here since there's two of them is circle these and really make sure that if you have a question that requires you to identify either carbon dioxide or pH that you are using the correct set of labels so that you don't get an easy question wrong here. Now this should be really straightforward because pH and CO2 in parts per million are very different. We're definitely not gonna have 8.2 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at any point in human history. And certainly we wouldn't have 350 as a pH, 
but on graphs that can be a little bit uh, less clear in terms of those labels, it's an important step to take. So in letter A, we have two determine prompts. Again, outdated task verb, but we're gonna circle it and write ones next to these and treat it like identify. In part one of letter A, we have to determine the concentration of CO2, so I'm gonna underline that, at the Mauna Lao Observatory in 2005. And so we just need to make sure again that we pay attention very closely here to which label we're using, which axes here, there are two Y axes. And so on an exam where you have this piece of paper in front of you, again, I'm doing this digitally, so I don't really have the ability to show you how to do this, but you should actually take a separate piece of paper and line it up with the year 2005 and use that separate piece of paper as a straight edge to trace it up to exactly where you would intersect. So again, I can't really put a straight edge on the screen for you, but I can do my best to draw a straight line that's not quite straight, but fairly straight, to show you how to simulate this idea of putting a straight piece of paper right on 2005 and using that to figure out where it intersects with your CO2 line, which is of course, this one here. In part two, we have to determine the pH recorded in 2005. So again, let's underline pH just to make sure that's the y axis that we're looking at here. And then, or y axis, I should say, singular in that plan. Man, axis, axes. Try that one 10 times. Then we're looking also at 2005. So it's the same line that you drew for CO2. But in this case, we're looking at where it intersects with our pH trend line. Now in B part one, we have another outdated task verb, which is predict, but predict is a pretty straightforward statement about how these two variables interact. So we should be able to get this in one sentence. What we're predicting is the effect of increased concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere on the concentration of CO2 in the ocean. So again, we want some statement about how increasing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere will impact the concentration of CO2 in the ocean. Now in part two, finally, we have a familiar task verb and identify, so we'll circle that and write a one above it. What we're identifying here is the relationship, and it's a relationship between the concentration of atmospheric CO2 and the pH of the ocean water. Now in part three, we have another outdated task verb provide, but we'll circle it and write a one next to it since what we need to provide is a complete chemical equation. So that's what our answer has to be. It has to be a chemical equation that represents the reaction specifically between oceanic carbon dioxide and water. They're giving you the formula here, CO2 and water H2O. You probably already knew those, but if you didn't, this needs to go in your chemical equation and you need to provide the complete chemical equation. And finally, in part four, we have an identify prompt, so I'm gonna circle that and write a one next to it. What we're identifying is the specific environmental problem that directly results from the decrease in pH of Earth's oceans. So again, our answer has to be a specific environmental problem, and it has to result from the decrease in pH of Earth's oceans. This word directly is important as well. And finally, in letter C, we have an explain prompt for part one, so let's circle that and write a three next to it. What we're explaining here is why certain organisms, especially those with calcium carbonate shells or exoskeletons, why are they threatened by decreasing pH levels in seawater? So this question, in effect, is ocean seawater is decreasing in pH, why is that a threat to organisms with calcium carbonate shells or exoskeletons? And in part two, we're asked other than threats posed by decreasing pH, identify, so let's circle that right one above it, an additional anthropogenic threat. So it has to be a human caused threat to the world's coral reef ecosystems. So again, it has to apply to coral reef ecosystems, it has to be an anthropogenic threat. But then we also have to describe how that threat damages the coral reefs and the coral reef ecosystems. And that's it, our ninth of nine FRQ Friday practice FRQs. Thanks so much for coming along on this journey with me this year. Now, if you've watched every single video in the series, make sure to drop a comment below so that I can personally congratulate you on becoming a certified ape scholar. And remember that if you want your practice FRQ scored in our next FRQ Friday video, make sure to email or snail mail it to me. Make sure to tune in next week for the final video in the FRQ Friday series. And as always, 
think like a mountain, and write like a scholar.